And I'm just wondering if we've been domesticating each other for 100,000 plus years, are we going to be the ones who domesticate the machine learning algorithms or are they by starting to build the bridge back to us and starting to push our buttons are they going to domesticate us are we yes where are we here why are we here not entirely clear we are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all it's immensely bizarre here we are hello everybody and welcome to the here we are podcast this is a special episode i call a lot of episodes special but like i've said before Anytime I have a return guest, that means you guys uh, can uh, rest easy and be confident in knowing that uh, they're going to be good. Why would I, if I, there was a guest that I didn't think was good, it would be weird to have them back on the show for no reason whatsoever. So you already know that this is going to be a really good episode. This is actually, so first off, if you know me, some, uh, 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 some of my favorite subjects are going to be covered a lot of evolution, a lot of evolutionary psychology, a lot of mating behavior stuff. So you already know this is the stuff that I love talking about. And over the last year with the pandemic and everything else, I feel like over the last couple of years, we haven't touched on the subject as much as I had very early on in the podcast. So a lot of you new to the show are going to be uh, exposed to some pretty awesome ideas, I think. And those of you that are more familiar, uh, you're going to get to hear a lot of awesome takes as well, because my guest today was on the very first season of Here We Are. When did we, like seven years ago or something, right? It doesn't feel like that long ago, I must say. It, it's just it, it might have been, it might have been six years. I, I, I got to do the math, but it was, it was a very long uh, time ago, depending on how you measure time and your relationship with temporal space. But my guest has a, uh, a very uh, exciting brand new book. Is it out now in North America? You know, 7 September, it's out in North America. So, Oh, my um, goodness. Maybe I'll hold on to this and release it then. We'll talk about that. That might be a smarter move. But Sweet, yeah. And well, well can they pre-order it? They can pre-order it. Pre-orders are open. Copies are shipping. I've even got um, the North American copies arrived in my at my house yesterday in Australia. So um, they, they, I think they're shipping from uh, various places in North America and Europe. Awesome. Well, we'll put that out right away because people people don't always listen to the podcast exactly the first week that it comes out. And since people can order online the book Artificial Intimacy, Virtual Friends, Digital Lovers, and Algorithmic Matchmakers, my guest today is Rob Brooks. Thank you, Rob, for joining the show once again after all these years. Shay, that's such a delight to be back and chatting to you. It really is. We were just kids back then, weren't we? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll tell you what, you didn't have that magnificent beard the last time I saw you. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, COVID. I just decided it's a whole long thing, but I just decided to let the hair grow out and everything else. And so uh, here we go. Here well, we are. Um, my partner got the old clippers out on me on the weekend, and I, I didn't realize we were doing this on video. So I was like, let it rip. We'll be fine. <laughs> the next day you say, Hey, we're going to do this on video. So anyway, um, the headphones are good. They're a good addition. I think the hair looks fantastic. Um, Thanks, so, uh, so first of all, this is also just such a perfect time to be talking about this subject. We're all still, so, so Rob is coming from Sydney, Australia, the best city in Australia. I will fight you, Melbourne. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Australia in general is, is one of my favorite places in the world. Go there if you can. But um, uh, all of us are, are still very much in the middle of dealing with COVID and various forms of, of uh, lockdowns and restrictions and remote um, 
learning and work and that sort of thing. And I've had a really one of the one of the interest one of the great things about covid for me was there was a lot of pros to doing this podcast virtually rather than in person um there's just a different vibe to it and i don't have to awkwardly set up all my equipment in some professor's office or whatever or come into their home and make awkward small talk and and make everyone nervous and there's all this build up to it now i just get to hey when are you available and and we meet up also, I just have uh, I've connected with so many old friends remotely, old high school friends. I've had meetup groups and game nights virtually, and I've had like really rich uh, remote experiences that uh, our uh, our ancestors never got to have when pandemics and things happen and just one week ago rob for the very first time ever i got on a dating app my first ever dating app and so i'm so excited to talk to you this is such a relevant topic uh, for everyone and we're not we're going to be talking not just about uh the current state of technology and and uh, those those new opportunities that we have, but what our long evolved history um, uh, has uh, has to do with how we interact with a lot of these new technologies. So Rob, could you tell the audience, could you give them a little bit of an introduction to yourself? And uh, yeah, let's start with that and then got a follow up for you. All right, so I'm, I'm an evolutionary behavioral scientist. Um, I started out as a biologist looking at little animals. In fact, um, I was looking for something to do my, my PhD on, and I realized that my girlfriend lived 600 kilometers away from me. So um, I, I was looking around in her hometown rather than my hometown to give me a reason to do this sort of commute. And uh, we found that there were streams with guppies in them. This is in South Africa. Um, which is not where guppies come from. They come from Trinidad and South America. Uh, but there was somebody had released their aquarium fish there. And I figured out I could study mate choice um, on these little animals. And so I started doing this. Um, and in South Africa, you know, you, you pick something and you're more or less allowed by your professor to go forth and do whatever you want for several years, often far too many years. Um, and I got really interested in mate choice and how it evolves and at exactly that time, there was this idea suddenly coming about that, uh, you know, sex is an old sort of, you shouldn't view it through rose-tinted spectacles um, where, you know, you, you see things that happen in the animal world and you go, well, that's because she's assessing him for his quality, etc. Well, very often sex is kind of nasty. So the, the um, bugs that walk on top of the streams instead of swimming below the streams, the, the um, water striders, for example, you know, the male will hop on the female or not the male many males will hop on a female and just try to mate with her and she doesn't need to mate she's got enough sperm to last a lifetime from her first mating uh, but sometimes she'll mate just to sort of get him off her back and you know we were all looking at this and going well why does she do this this is for the best you know she's trying to get the best male and the best sperm and the best genes and actually there were a couple of biologists uh called Jorn Arnqvist and Locke Rowe who had been looking at these exact animals and they went, no, there's conflict here. You know, that um, males and females are not always working together, even when they're having sex. And, you know, there was some theory around, had been around for about 20 years, but suddenly this field exploded in this, this idea that even a mummy and a daddy who love each other very much don't want the same things all the time. They don't yeah. necessarily want to have the same number of babies. They don't agree on the timing of that. They don't agree on whose chance it is to do the vacuuming, you know, or whose chance it is to cook or to get up um, and look after the baby. And, you know, often we're dealing with mummies and daddies who don't necessarily love each other very much or who are thrust into circumstances that, um, that, that don't work equally well for them. And so right. I realise that there's just this rich, you know, body of ideas out there that can be applied to small animals, uh, which is what I was kind of trained to work with, or they can apply to humans. And so slowly over 20 years or so, 
have been increasingly thinking, how do we apply these powerful ideas from evolutionary biology about mate choice and about uh, genetic influences of parents and offspring and about the conflict between mates and between parents and offspring? How do we apply these to human society and to the fact that sex and relationships and family life are just incredibly complicated? Uh, and so that's basically the story of my career, moving from, from small animals to increasingly on working on humans. And now I'd say about 65% of my work is on humans. And that includes mm. writing books about, you know, the consequences of evolutionary ideas for humans. Yeah. I, I think that one of the, you know, I was just talking with some, uh, people recently at a pickleball court. It's like old person tennis, if you're unfamiliar. Um, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like a mix between ping pong and, and tennis, but I, I was hanging out and I usually don't offer up what I do for a living because it comes along with questions. I'd prefer to just not answer. And I like being left alone, but, um, <laughs> I, know you're I, I, I brought up, uh, there was a, there was a psychology teacher there that I, I, I in, uh, the, guy that I've, I related to well. And, and, uh, so I, I told him that psychology was a uh, big interest in me uh, of mine and especially evolutionary psychology. And a few other people heard that and they were curious what that, what that was. And it's one of these things that man, that the general, uh, the general public and including myself until 10 years ago or so, just have no idea that, you know, you hear the word evolution and you think, Hey, we got these imposable thumbs and we stand upright. Okay. Got it. And it's finished. And people don't often think about how evolution, how our ancestral past has been, uh, has been shaped. It has shaped our brain, has shaped our mind, has shaped our consciousness, our perception, our mate preference, our mate behaviors. And, and it's the explanatory power of it is, really uh fascinating that's also uh, you you having this huge amount of uh wildlife examples that must make the birds and bees conversation go a little easier at home with now with the digital all of the it, kids have access to the most <laughs> ridiculous stuff on the internet these days and it's it's now you can be like oh that's that's what they call uh water striding uh here's here's these water striders doing that yeah as long as you can put it in like a, an eight second video it's called <laughs> yeah. you know i've got yeah. four teenagers or, or three teenagers and one teenager in my house at the moment and because we're all in lockdown you know they're all working doing right. their school or the university from home and um yeah when we can get them for a conversation around the dinner table it's it's fabulous because they're they're across so much of the stuff that you're cagey about talking to them about and then utterly naive in other areas so mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's good fun so tell us a uh, uh Tell us a little bit about the the book. Give us, give me just sort of a basic. What was the premise of the book? So you know, I began with um, this process of you know what is sexual conflict and this this view that um, there are conflicting interests between uh, mums and dads and between potential mates and between parents and offspring. How does that shape um, societies and how how is it that that feeds into making sex the complicated ideologically fraught thing that it is. And as I went through, and I, I, I was writing this book for quite a long time, not quite sure what it wanted to be, which is not any way to write a book, by the way, another learning. Um, I realized that the really big story at the moment is what happens when our evolved human natures and our quite old fashioned cultures, you know, we, we often pit those two things against each other, but these things are going, you know, more or less, they've, they've been together for a while and they know each other's, you know, faults and follies a little bit. But what happens when they smash headlong into to the technologies that, you know, the human minds have invented? Um, and particularly right now, there's this hugely exciting moment in technology where robotics is suddenly getting really good at doing a lot of things. 
virtual reality, which has been promising so much for 20 years or so, is maybe starting to really, you know, take a foothold. Um, and most important of all, artificial intelligence. You know, when we encounter these three technologies, um, what is, you know, how, do, how does that shape us and how do we shape those technologies, particularly machine learning? Because machine learning is uh, such a powerful data-driven algorithm for change. You know, I, I think the big algorithms for change are natural selection, um, with, by which evolution occurs, which is very slow because it has to go from generation to generation, passing on of genes, and the information only goes from parent to child to child to child. And and that's like, I mean, to have even the tiniest change in a hundred generations yeah. would be pretty significant, really. There are some spectacular examples of rapid evolution, but most of it is really yeah. slow and incremental and back and forth. And it's no way to get from A to B, put it that way. You know, right. it, it happens. Natural selection happens, but it happens at the pace of the universe. You know, nothing right, right. that's really relevant to us. We domesticate plants and animals on a pace that's sure. relevant to generations. And that, that's also quite slow. Uh, animals learn, humans learn, we have culture. There's another algorithmic process of change. But machine learning, as long as you throw the right data at a well-designed machine learning algorithm, it's going to learn and it's going to change. And it's going to learn and change in ways that we don't understand anymore. Mm. And so um, all of a sudden, we have these technological kind of mirrors that we've created. They're not really mirrors. They're, they're partners that we're working with that are learning from the data about what we do, how we move through our virtual worlds. And we just lay this trail of data down, you know, as we go through, through, through our virtual worlds. And they're basically learning the, the rules of human interaction and of how humans work and how humans um, you know, exert their preferences and uh, how they interact and how they make friends and all of these things. And probably they're learning things about us that we didn't even know were things. Um, mm -hmm. And so this technology in particular, I think, is going to become, you know, the defining technology of the next 50-odd years. And long before we ever invent an artificial general intelligence and have a singularity that where the, the machines can take over and program each other and make humans kind of, you know, redundant, which is what, you know, a, a good portion of the real experts in, in artificial intelligence think is going to happen. Uh, Long before we ever reach that point. I cannot wait to be redundant. Uh, yeah. I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't wait. I know people are concerned about it. I know people are worried about their jobs and everything else, but man, do I want to be a redundancy. I just want to kick up my feet and be redundant. Yeah. Yeah. It's like <laughs> timing for everybody, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> if done right. But I cut you off. I apologize. No, no, no. Just long before we get to anything like that, long before yeah. we get to the situation of asking other machines running the world, they will have learned about us and they will basically be, you know, using us as human batteries, not for energy in the sci fi kind of a way, but basically for figuring out what is it that is going to keep this person on platform, clicking through ads, reading the stuff that I generate for them, you know, so it's, it's social media turned up yeah. to 11. Um, yeah. And so I, I realized that, you know, I started with sex robots because everyone starts with sex robots because they're just so weird. <laughs> uh, and, and I kind of suddenly realized these things are kind of niche um, yeah, they're going to be interesting and they raise philosophical problems and, you know, we can argue about whether or not they're going to create objectification or or actually they're just going to be a great stress reliever for incels to just, you know, get their, their um, sense of sexual entitlement worked out in, in the dark somewhere in, the, in their parents' basement or whatever. Um, but actually what's even more interesting than sex robots is the possibility of virtual reality sex with characters that evolve in front of you, your eyes and that build mm -hmm. a relationship with you or virtual reality sex with people on the other side of the world or just friendships, you know, wh where you don't realize that you're actually, 
your friendship is now with a machine, with your social media account rather than with the people that it says it's representing. And so, yeah. you know, it, it's actually quite hard to be focused about this, as you'll see in this discussion, because it's just this proliferation of possible technologies. And I've tried to keep it anchored on things that are kind of familiar and happening right now, because otherwise, you know, you could go to you, there's no end to the imagination in terms of what's possible with these technologies. Yeah. So, man, I have a lot of different angles here. Um, <laughs> Me so, too, man. <laughs> so, so I'm sure. So, one, uh, let's just get this out of the way. Did you see the Black Mirror episode that was like the two guys playing the video game and you didn't? I haven't seen oh. that. You know what? Black Mirror is just this. Um, every time I have a conversation with someone, they point out a different episode that's super relevant to me. And there's a period during which I was sort of writing the book and finishing the book where I I didn't watch a lot of that um, mm -hmm. because every time I watched something or read something that people recommended to me, the book changed, you know, um, and so. Yeah, it it's AI and futurist heavy. There's a particular episode where during, you know, play playing like a Street Fighter you know, virtual game where you really feel the punches and everything, they decide to have a, a more intimate relationship than that and, and the implications of it. Um, oh. It just it just uh, made uh, it, it popped into my head as you were talking about having, uh, you know, relationships with avatars in another country or or whatever. And um, so what? OK. I'll go with the deeper question first. This isn't necessarily attached. Uh, this is this is more broad than uh, than sex and mating stuff, but very relevant. So there 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 tends to be this um, this this probably a little bit of a conflict uh, that I notice sometimes. It's probably uh, not that significant, and I I think it's one of those things where you know the old nature nurture debate is now everyone kind of realizes it's a bit of both but there's something with evolution evolutionary biology evolutionary psychology and sociology where it seems like sociologists say no everything's culture and we're influenced by culture and we are the way that we are because of whatever movies that you watched or whatever and uh, uh, were you rich or were you poor and and uh, and then there's all of these evolutionary thinkers going uh, and and I tend to maybe value this side more e even it's not it's not even that they're weighted equally on a scale, but just that I see that the the evolutionary side of things is something that is, I think, underrepresented within the way in which the public kind of thinks about things and so the evolutionary side of things tends to say well yeah but where the heck do you think culture emerged from it emerged from many of our own preferences some of these uh, some of these aspects of culture that you're saying are are uh, are these um uh, maybe not inevitable but these sort of phenotypic expressions of what is inside of our minds these these uh this romeo and juliet or you know whatever these different things that we see in uh in movies for example might just be kind of exaggerated representations of our own inner nature feelings uh desires drives that um that potentially our hunter-gatherer ancestors had uh long before there was any any concept anything close to even theater let alone um modern television and uh, the reason why I bring it up, one, you might have a take on that yourself, but two, uh, how, how do you think this applies to the things that you're studying with artificial intelligence, whereas is this kind of starting to make its own decisions and influencing us or are we mostly building these things? I heard you I heard you say something along the lines of we don't even know exactly what we're making. Where do you fall in in that camp or you probably see a little bit of both sides of it? Yeah, look, um, 
so many answers and and if you if you want to know what i think about uh about that question all of you know many of the things that i think that that's really a big theme that runs through the book so okay. let me see if i can give you a few a few insights into that i think you know, I, I obviously come from an evolutionary background, so I'm very sympathetic to evolutionary explanations. And I also realized that, you know, right at the big, you know, our cross to bear as evolutionary biologists, excuse the religious metaphor, is the history of the, the nasty things that have been done and continue to be done in its name. You know, people who, who, whose natural inclination, social inclination is to blame the victim Mm-hmm. tend to, um, you know, try and present all of the, the inequalities and all of the things that are wrong in the world or that, that at least the lefties think are wrong in the world as um, as as the, the, the way things are. This is just how mm-hmm. it is. This is how, you know, we evolved and, you know, deal with it. And we go, it goes all the way back to Herbert Spencer, you know, in the Victorian times who was very much into laissez-faire economics and sort of, um, evolution is a great metaphor for his notions of human progress, which largely had Victorian Englishmen up on top. Um, and, and you know, then that's appropriated by Galton and the eugenicists, and then that's appropriated and, and distorted by the Nazis. And, you know, here we are, as you like to say. Um, so, you know, that that's on one side. And we have to, to bear that cross. Unfortunately, I think the social sciences, in trying to avoid those problems, in the early 20th century, basically throughout all biology. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's this famous quote, Albert Kroeber, who's uh, said to be the dean of American archae- anthropology, famously said, um, biology cannot be allowed to have played any role in history. You know, for me, that's an empirical question. How did biology shape history? Well, let's go and find out how. In some mm-hmm. ways or another, it must have because we're biological organisms. But, you know, the, the mantra in a lot of the social sciences for over 100 years has been, we can't let biology have anything to do with this. So when you go in with a biological explanation about something, let's say, you know, sex differences on some task, um, you're, the, the sociologist, sociologically oriented scientists will say, well, you just don't have, you've got a failure of sociological imagination because you're just not seeing how powerful and pervasive socialization is. Um, mm. To which my answer would be, well, show me, uh, show me how it works empirically. And sometimes very often that, you know, they can, and there, there are powerful sociological processes at play, but that doesn't mean biology doesn't happen. Just the same as saying something has, you know, some biological underpinnings does not mean that there's not a sociological process involved. You know, brains change in response to experience and we assimilate experience and we respond to experience in particular predictable ways because of the ways in which those experiences change our brains. So there is a very direct interaction between the two. So the people on the other side, I said that the the victim blamers tend to gravitate towards an evolutionary view and Mm. people who think that it's the system that's to blame naturally find that what we want to do is we want to change the system. So we want to persuade ourselves that it's all system and that it's all changeable. And we know we can't, you know, deal with persistent, difficult social problems simply by imagining that they always have a sociological or a a narrative-based solution. I I think the Mm -hmm. notion that as long as you change the narrative and the words that you use and, you know, you're going to effect change, um, to be quite kind of childish and wishful in its in its mm-hmm. way, you know, maybe that's all we have access to changing. And I appreciate people's, you know, wish to do better. Uh, and I think the people, everybody, should be trying to do better on on difficult issues. Um, but you know, if you change the narrative by which you frame some historic events, you don't actually change those historic events. You just change the way you're talking about them. Uh, so you're only doing, you know, you're, you're only getting part way there. Yeah. I think um, the probably the most important insight into both 
the sort of nature nurture, what Stephen Pinker calls the last wall standing in the landscape of knowledge, um, and how nature and nurture interact, and, and this really does go to the machine learning future, I think, is that the most important thing that ever happened in human evolution happened, you know, early on in the the anatomically modern human era, or probably just before that. It's probably what set us apart from Homo erectus, which was, you know, the, the last very distinguishable ancestor. So Homo erectus comes out of Africa, spreads through most of the old world, um, and then you have these other branches like Neanderthals and Den Denisovans who are pretty much like anatomically modern humans, but we can just distinguish them in a fossil way. And so somewhere between say 200,000 years ago and 70,000 years ago, we have this enormous change in which we've gone from being, you know, having ancestors with chimps and bonobos who just, you know, have multi-male, multi-female mating system. Males have nothing to do with the offspring apart from, you know, trying not to kill them. Um, females have these ongoing associations with their kids, but nothing like this hyper-investing parenting that we have. Suddenly, we, we have this ability to focus on one mate for a period of, at a time. Doesn't mean we're a monogamous species, but we can do monogamy for periods of you know years or months or even weeks sometimes, um, <laughs> and and work together with that mate that we concentrate on, and also yeah. to to help relatives to mate and to help our grandchildren to grow up. And suddenly we have this very social way of bringing up offspring and of investing in human capital, which is, yeah. you know, completely new innovation in, in terms of the way that our, our very helpless offspring learn and stay with us well into their 30s in, in many cases. Um, and on top of that, we, we have this ability to, um, to – to coordinate our actions, to imagine a future, and to, to coordinate what we do in order to bring that future about. You know, whether it's build this building or secure this place off from predators or, you know, um, domesticate uh, a plant or, or whatever. But so by 70,000 years or so ago, this is in place. Um, Yuval Noah Harari calls it the, the cognitive revolution. Bill mm -hmm. von Hippel calls it the social leap, and I'm I like to call it the taming of humanity because what we're doing while we're interacting with each other and cooperating with each other, we are actually killing despotic, violent men who just want to take and take and take. I think people are weaker. People can band together to kill them or chase them mm -hmm. away, just the way that humans killed. Um, snappy, aggressive wolves or chase them away and thereby change the wolf gene pool living nearby them and thereby domesticated dogs. We are yeah. killing violent men and we are selecting to be part of our group and therefore not to starve and therefore to pass on genes the people who are good at cooperating, the people who talk about what they want to do next and who are honest about those things. And so suddenly we have this building up of this incredibly social species based on where, where apes and monkeys groom each other for about 20% of their waking hours by picking at each other's fur, we develop this, this language system, evolve, sorry, this language system that allows us to talk to each other and to share our thoughts. And we can share our thoughts with not just one person, like I'm doing with you right now, but with tens or hundreds or millions in the case of your podcast listeners, Shane, <laughs> you know, we're, we're able to share ideas like that. Our, our grooming is our gossip and our gossip is our way that we navigate our social landscape and sort of map our social landscape. And we're suddenly these super cooperative apes that, yeah, we can see the violence and the misery and the bad parenting and the bad partnering and the non-monogamy and all of those kind of things. We can see that. But that's because we're really tuned to it because we ha are, have been regulating that for 100,000 years and selecting for the genes that basically, you know, make people good at doing the cooperative stuff. We've been domesticating ourselves. Right. So that's really interesting. And I think that's a really important insight. And that's biology and culture, culture, biology going along with each other for over 100,000 years, going in various different directions and sometimes down blind alleys, but nonetheless building up something incredibly cumulative 
Right. Now suddenly, I have a courtesy of Steve Jobs, this thing in my hand where I can interact with other people. And it not only am I interacting with other people, but those conversations go into data that machine learning algorithms can learn. And they can see how am I grooming other people? They can't necessarily see me chatting to my partner, although, you know, I'm convinced my Google Home does that anyway. Um, but they can see the stuff that we're doing online. And these are now the ways we're gossiping and grooming and navigating that social landscape. And all of a sudden, you go, these things that can learn are probably le are definitely learning the rules by which we interact and what keeps us going and what brings us closer together and what causes friendships to fall apart and what causes you to stay up arguing with your ex online all night and all of those kinds of things. Um, and I'm just wondering if we've been domesticating each other for a hundred thousand plus years, are we going to be the ones who domesticate the machine learning algorithms or are they by starting to build the bridge back to us and starting to push our buttons, are they going to domesticate us mm. and to take over that job? Is that one more thing we're going to outsource to the machines, the domestication of our species? You know, yeah, and I don't have yeah. a definitive answer to that, but I think it's a really worthwhile philosophical point to think about. Yeah. I, it's, uh, it, <sighs> It's it's so fascinating because one of one of the things that there are so many things within culture that you know from an alien anthropology point of view seems so out there and bizarre that you think well what what even could evolution have to do with anything so, uh, it, it, you know, take some like very bizarre cult behavior or something like that. But then when you pull back, you do see that they're, that they are interact. It's, it's kind of evolution is often, evolution often has kind of built the capacity for, for something. And then culture often is filling in the details. So you might have uh, evolution might shape this, this need for a, uh, uh, like a, a need for an in-group, a need for, uh, it, there might be a lot of utility in a belief in a higher power that gets you to spring out of bed each day and be more productive and think outside of yourself. And then the details of what that specific higher power is can be anything from reasonable to completely insane, but it can still fill that exact same need for a lot of people. Uh, much in the same way that some people are Twitter people, some people are <laughs> Instagram people, and uh, but you can't. You you still at, at a certain point there's still there's still evolutionary constraints. It would seem in that. It, you you could fill you could fill a environment rich with information that is all you know in ultraviolet light or something like that. but but if you're sending that to a species that doesn't interpret uh, ultraviolet uh, light and doesn't register ultraviolet light it's completely worthless um and so it, it man that it is it you know we had to be social it if it was solitary if solitary animals kept evolving complexity and started you know building their own technologies it's seems less likely that they would come up with social media you know because it, it wouldn't necessarily be in a sloth's nature to come up to interact with every other sloth around the world, or maybe it would be if it if it was in its individual benefit. Yeah, it's you know I, I think that the the fact that we are so very social disposes yeah. us to to something like social media. Yeah, you're right. It's, a sloth wouldn't be interested. You know, the thought experiment I, I had the other day. I was watching the Olympics watching the bizarre closing ceremony, really. And I was thinking about how social 
we really I only are. saw a couple minutes of it, but oh, yeah. it, it, it was weird. But the whole Olympics. So, <laughs> so imagine you've got a bunch of chimps or a bunch of bonobos. Okay, our closest living relatives. We, you know, people love to say we're ninety nine percent DNA the same as chimps and bonobos. If you took a hundred chimps or a hun- even a hundred bonobos, who you know they they're much more peaceable. Um, probably because they encounter other groups much less often. That's the main reason they're, they're more peaceful. Um, but if you took a hundred of any type of ape and you put them in a new environment, you would have warfare. It'd just be, you know, kill or be killed for a period of time until it's stabilized. Okay. What did we do? A city of 14 million people. That is a bizarre statement in itself. 14 million upright walking apes live in a city. Put aside questions of the pandemic and just go, how do they not kill each other all the time? (laughs) Okay. Or in Sydney where I live, 5 million upright walking apes. Yeah. Get along most days. You know, yeah, we get cross with each other and, and, you know, there are, you know, people yelling at each other, et cetera, but nothing like you would expect in any other animal if you were to put these strangers together in a place and then ship in, now we're going back to Tokyo, shipping in from all around the world people from all sorts of out groups to compete against each other and they don't kill each other. They even have, some of them have javelins and they don't yeah. put them through someone's head and you go, that's a pretty in- impressive social achievement that people are able to do that. They're able to talk through the details and agree that when we get to the airport, we won't immediately go to war. Um, yeah, and, that, sorry. Go yeah, on. no, that's just a reflection of, of this, this weird thing. So the fact that we have, we've built technologies that can connect us and suddenly we're using them to connect to all sorts of other people because not only do we like the people that we know and we like, but we're actually curious enough about other people, even people whose views we think we dislike or who we disagree with or we, who we want to have a little argument with, we, we're interested enough in them to connect to them wherever they are in the world and to try and find out more about them. And yeah. That's just a, a remarkable piece of zoology <laughs> that I can't yeah. quite get over. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even even something like uh, UFC, which is uh, uh, tamer than it used to be, but still, you know, arguably uh, one of the more violent uh, sports, uh, at, at least at least in the U.S. and uh, and you look at that, and and there's still there's still something within all sports and all cons- uh, um, competition that is um, this. Uh, seemingly as you were saying the domestication since the cognitive revolution uh, domesticating ourselves it does seem like a dissipation of of evolved tendencies towards ag- aggression and war it seems like a, a much more healthy or at, at least physically safer expression of maybe some of those i i don't i don't have any particular uh desire to a drop kick someone on a given day. I don't think they drop kick in UFC, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but but there's but the point is even even what looks to us to be some of our most violent behavior is quite a toned down version of something a, a lot of other species are participating in. Whereas if if a if it was a true, if you know, if your UFC was a true death match, you would you would take the best weapon you had at your disposal, some gun or something, and you'd shoot that. Per- we'd all we'd all shoot each other. We'd all be done because if that if that was the goal of things, just to end life or you know whatever, to to really show aggression in the most uh, in the most efficient and successful way, you know, we would we would all be goners. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, obviously, you know, violence still happens. There, there's a lot of state versus state violence. There's a lot of um, sort of insurrectionist violence. There's a lot of domestic terrorism. And obviously, intimate partner violence is still an enormous source of violence. 
you know, however, I think if you if you look at the data and you look at the sort of things that Stephen Pink has accumulated, um, you'll see that that you know violence has dr dropped dramatically throughout history and even throughout recent history. Um, and so, you know, I think humans understand that part what of the that? reason. Sorry, uh, what, what, what is it? Better angels of our nature, or something. Yes. What, what are his books? He, he talks it, fantastic books. He talks quite a bit about that. Actually, uh, my, my yeah, laptop's resting on a copy right now. I can see uh, just yeah, out of our show. Fantastic to you. writer. Yeah. So, so you know, violence is still very much a part of human life. Um, but you know, one of the big functions I think of human society and social organization is is to recognize that there is this compulsion towards violence and to find, obviously, to avoid its worst outcomes and to try and manage it and to try and prevent people, you know, domesticate people, weed out those impulses to, to be um, instantly reactive and high stress and, you know, like the, the snappy antisocial wolves, you know, just deal with that issue, whether that issue is arising through something that's you know the, the biological pathways by which it arises and the cultural social economic you know um childhood history of deprivation whatever um whatever the origins there i think that societies most societies most of the time recognize that the, that they need to regulate that need to downplay it that they won't accept uh you know gratuitous violence and even that losses of individuals in warfare are not acceptable you know we right this week we're looking at the horrific images coming out of afghanistan and looking at the us having withdrawn with what 7000 us troops lost in 20 years mm -hmm. compare that and the political cost to successive american administrations of 7000 uh, people lost in a in a foreign campaign. Napoleon, in the first half of eighteen twelve, lost three hundred and fifty eight thousand Frenchmen in mm -hmm. trying to to take Russia, um, and that wasn't that long ago. That was two hundred and and a few years ago. Um, you know, yeah. he boasted. He basically Napoleon was so successful because he had the best conscription. You know. Um, set up in all of Europe and he boasted that he spends 30,000 men a month and so nobody can stop him. Um, and and so um, I think that, that there's a, 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 throughout history, particularly throughout the history of the societies that I know anything about right now, um, there's this increasing recognition that, you know, individual life is precious and that's exactly as it should be and that violence mm -hmm. should be restrained, but also that our impulses towards competition and towards violence and towards overcoming people from other tribes, et cetera, et cetera, are still there in some vestigial form. Um, and, you know, we, I, I think there's this recognition that sport is both a great joiner together of people and a kind of ritualized warfare in which, you know, yeah. the other tribe can be humiliated briefly for a period of time. And then you can get on with things and shake hands and have a beer in the sheds afterwards. And, um, and everything's, you know, everybody's still alive, hopefully at the end of that. Um, yeah. 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 There, there's, there's something about, uh, uh, especially with the UFC where it's the, uh, the idolization of like, oh, that's a part, that's an expression of who we are. And many of us should strive, we would do better to strive to be like that. Certainly in basketball, there was like, uh, like Mike, if I could be like Mike was the thing with the Michael Jordan when I was growing up. But it made you want to get a little bit better at basketball really now 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 ufc is like people want to listen to a podcast what's your whole philosophy on life teach me everything be my mentor it is a it's a it's a strange thing that there's still um it, you know it, it, there there's still that there's still that 
kind of hijacking of status <laughs> that comes with seeing big biceps or something like it's something that is in some respects utterly useless in a modern culture where you know it it, it only takes not that many troops to stabilize a region for decades or whatever, uh, somewhat stabilize a region. And, uh, and, and where it, you know, like we said, when it, if it, if you're on the street, you know, it doesn't really matter how big your biceps are or anything like that, but we still kind of see that. And it still, it still does something. It's still, it still hijacks our reward systems in such a way or or in the way that social media uses uh, filters and and uh, airbrushing and that sort of thing to hijack some of these internal uh, drives and desires that we have. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, social media, I think, is providing this incredible mirror on humanity right now. I've got yeah. this... Um, colleague at the University of Melbourne. She used to work with me. I'm not sure if, if you maybe even had her on your podcast, Candice Blake. Um, oh, she, Candice is great. Yeah. yeah cool. Yeah, so yeah. so Candice has built this um, this way of basically downloading all of the Twitter um, or at least a significant portion. Oh, no. Of it. <laughs> the, and then does she throw it in the garbage or does she does she cry a lot afterwards? What's I think the, she goes through it God. like she, she has this geolocating algorithm because not yeah. everybody goes, you know, hi, I'm from Sydney, Australia. Um, so this geolocating algorithm works out where people are from or where they're tweeting from um, using various cues that are, you know, way above my pay grade. Um, mm -hmm. And and so then we have this resource, and she's worked. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with her in a few papers. She did one on where people are posting sexy selfies from, and she did another one on where you know online misogyny, people saying nasty things about women. Um, and we've got one coming out really soon on incels. So mm. where are the incels posting from? And um, it's actually. There's there's a couple of chapters in the book devoted to incels, and the story gets a bit of a preliminary airing then. But the the papers coming out should be out in about September or October, um, and it seems like all of these things are hugely driven by inequality. And I'm not talking about gender inequality. We, what we thought would happen would be you know where women um, don't have as much political power or aren't as educated or don't earn as much as men, you would see uh, a lot more sexy selfies posted because, you know, that's your main route to social mobility is through your looks rather than through your work. At least it's, you know, the, the balance is different. Um, and actually we found that that's not a very good predictor of sexy selfies and it's not a good predictor of incels, which we can – slightly different story because there we're talking about men. Um, but what is is inequality in Inequality, as we know, you know, high inequality societies are incredibly corrosive. They can be quite violent. Mm -hmm. There's high homicide. There's, you know, people um, are more likely to get pregnant without, you know, having support around them, etc. And we think that um, what's happening is in, in a high inequality society, the differences between the haves and the have-nots are so substantial that it's really worth striving with everything that you've got. Whereas you know, in a lower inequality society, it's a bit like, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be okay and those guys aren't going to get way ahead of me anyway. And so we're a bit more chill about motives, yeah. et cetera. Um, and so here we see the signature and you think online is online. It's this weird space that exists around the world because, you know, I could post something and the person next door can see it at the same time as you see it, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in another continent. But actually what's happening in your local area influences your life and then is reflected back in what you're doing on social media in detectable ways. Right. Um, and uh, in fact, her, her work on, on um, intimate partner, uh, on uh, mis online misogyny shows that, you know, where in places where you get these big upspringings in online misogyny, you see a, 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 a um, following kind of hump in intimate partner violence police uh, reports, et cetera. So again, what's happening on social media reflects what's happening locally in the real world. 
um, mm. which is a surprise to some people, particularly, you know, folks who are all about, you know, culture and narratives only and throw the biology out. Um, they think that, you know, the internet hates women and this is a consequence of just of the internet and some global miasma. But actually, it's very, you know, people's real lives are reflected in what's happening out there in, in social media land. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that that's that's incredible. Um, and I do want to talk more about incels, too. Don't worry, listeners, because I know I know the listeners want to hear more about that. But before that, um, I, I was curious. So so there are there there's cooperation is hard to get to take off from the onset is my understanding evolutionary is hard to it's hard to get to take off but once it's established it's exceptionally successful in uh, a lot of species and game theory models and stuff it's it's it works really well but getting it off the ground damn how do you do that do you, do you isolate a population on this small island and then there's reciprocal altruism that takes off from uh, you know whatever but um the regarding the the domestication it does seem like okay we're we're taming ourselves as humans but then when you bring up an issue like inequality man the difference between the haves and have nots in our hunter gatherer ancestors is like the difference between having um, the low grade Hyundai Elantra and the and the high grade premium Hyundai Elantra. Like, okay, that person has the leather seats. This other person has the crappy fabric seats, and and they don't have the the same uh they don't have the screen in the in that model of the car or whatever where now we're living in a world where it's like this person has a bicycle and this person has a lamborghini or a million dollar tractor or something like that and it's it's the even even within my lifetime of going from CEOs making thirty times uh, their average employee to now uh, now three hundred times in Fortune five hundred companies, and the, that's speaking of something that's accelerating. Uh, that's that's something that is. I think during COVID, however many billion dollars the the average American lost is like the exact same number that billionaires have gotten as a, as an increase. And if, what, what does that, what does that do? If, if you kind of touched on that a little bit with, with people that are maybe lower in status, having to a lot more pressure to advertise what and play up what little that they already have. Um, but what does that do in terms of aggression and violence and crime and other things? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's really tricky to, to, to figure out because in some respects we are in sort of uncharted territory with the, the kinds of inequalities that are present, but also the kinds of inequalities that are visible. So, you know, you're right, hunters and gatherers, you know, they can only take with them what they can carry if they're mobile uh, foragers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, material possessions, and, and they didn't have Lamborghinis or bicycles then, so, you know, um, they weren't helping with the mobility. Um, so so you, you're, you're limited in, in how much you can take your wealth with you. Um, and similarly, your cooperation is really important because you're depending really directly on other people day to day to cooperate mm -hmm. with you. If you don't, if you come home without food tonight, you really need your neighbors to share their food with you, no matter how high status you are. So there is a real ceiling on that. And then, you know, people have this, this aversion to status. They, they don't want to see it run away. And part of our domesticating of ourselves, I think, is, is this, persistent cutting down of, of tall puppies or of despots who just want to take and not to give. Um, and part of the, the issue with, you know, from agriculture onwards, 
10,000 years ago when we first domesticated um, cereal grains and were able to accumulate wealth and hang on to it and defend it is that we have um, levels of inequality that have not been seen before in history. The people don't even necessarily have the ability to completely comprehend. If, if you know, one of the famous experiments is you'll show people various distributions of wealth between the poor and the rich in societies, and they'll say, okay, which is your society? And people underestimate the level of inequality by about a magnet, you know, an, an order of 10. So mm -hmm. you're, um, you, you may be complaining about the level of inequality around you and how much rich people make, et cetera, but you still actually underestimate just how extreme that is. So we don't really have the social tools to compute inequality on the level of, on which it, it really is occurring. Um, yeah. I, I was just, this, this just flashed into my mind. I'm not sure if you ever s have seen this video. I think it was, I think I saw it in, I don't know if it was his study, but Franz De Waal, I believe was, uh, was talking about it. Um, he wrote the book, the age of empathy or inner ape. Um, yeah. and, and he, there's this, there's this video of these two, I wish I could remember the species, um, cause I don't think they were chimps, but there, there are these two monkeys in separate cages and, and so they show this monkey is, uh, is more than happy to do whatever trick, uh, <laughs> the, the caretaker wants or do whatever task for a little bit of cucumber. It's not his favorite treat in the world, but more than happy, it'll take the cucumber. And then, but then it shows a monkey next to it and there's a, a there's a transparent screen so it can see the other monkey and you give the other monkey like a cheeto or some like high valued treat and and now this monkey that was perfectly happy with the cucumber before is throwing the cucumber back at the researcher and throwing a fit and refusing to do the task and that's the difference between a cucumber and Cheetos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that, that we also underestimate is that, it, you know, when I was a kid, we could see what American life on television was like. You know, we thought it was great and we all couldn't wait to get there so that we could drink cherry Coke because <laughs> we only had regular <laughs> Coke. Um, but... Now you're seeing, you know, with social media, you can be, you know, in, in some rural area in Tanzania and on social media you can see what, you know, rich people are posting about their lives or at least about what they want you to think about their lives in, you know, in California. Um, yeah. And so suddenly the, the – and, and the rich people aren't looking quite as much at the Tanzanians to see what they're doing and posting on social media, you know, right. um, and the algorithms aren't serving that up either. And so – you have this this continual kind of looking upwards or looking at more wealthy and influential people than you. And instead of having these secondhand accounts of, you know, how how magical things are in the faraway kingdom, you can actually peer into the faraway kingdom and see it. And, you know, this disaffectation that that has to breed, uh, mm. you know, politically as well as just economically is just, you know, I don't think we've come to, to – to grow to grapple with that yet uh yeah it's pretty substantial and it's a source of great unhappiness well i, I wonder how much too because we we have so much we have so much evolutionary drive to play up our abilities in ways uh to um to embellish maybe our social standing or our intellect or our income maybe you take you take someone on a date and yeah or uh, oh on me no problem and you run a bunch of things up on a credit card and buy a bunch of gifts and maybe rent a really nice car and and make it look like you're doing a little bit better than you can and there's a lot of ways to especially in our modern age to uh to fake it and as you're talking about social media man i was thinking of uh of a friend of mine today that I saw on social media and I, 
uh, man, I, I, I wish them well, but they are, I know them personally and they're exceptionally addicted to travel and luxurious ish lifestyles and portraying that on social media. And I know personally that they are living way beyond their means. And every time I see that, I'm like, Oh no, you don't know what you're setting yourself up for like every time you take a trip I, that I know that you can't pay for like you are really getting yourself so there there's pressure on them to advertise those things for whatever reason they don't even they're not looking for a mate anymore it's not really necessarily increasing their social standing it's maybe helping their self self-esteem or whatever but then people seeing that think that that person is doing really well because they're in this uh infinity pool with like the Breck floating breakfast served to them or whatever like oh man like no there is there is nothing uh there's very little reality going on and in, in on either side of this interaction uh, you know from from the person putting out the single signal or the person receiving it what a mess yeah it it, it is a mess it's it's you you really have to think very deliberately and consciously about what you're seeing. You know, I had a friend the other day, and and he was posting about you know his partner, um, and very kind of um, glowing things about this partner, and quite fussy things. And I called him up and said, "Mate, you know, are you okay? You're obviously not going through a very good patch there." And he's like, "How did you know?" And I said, because I can see in social media, you're, you're going on about your relationship. You know, <laughs> when people are happy in their relationships, they're not doing that. Um, and he's like, you're so right, actually. This is, you know, going horribly wrong right now. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's, it's just. That's a hilarious and yeah. sad example. It's unfortunately, Man. it seems to be, to be so true. And I reckon that the machine learning algorithms, getting back to them, have probably figured that one out. You know, we, we know that Facebook can tell when you're going to break up um, and, and is, is better than human judges at predicting from mm. what you're posting on, on your timeline and on other people's walls. Um, you know, it's, it's really good at pre predicting when you're about to break up. So when those ads mm -hmm. for divorce lawyers start popping up in the right hand side of your Facebook feed, um, know that you know Facebook's learned something about the, your your patterns um, and or about other people's patterns of posting and are starting to apply that to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what about there? There's uh, and and this isn't. By the way, this isn't to. Uh, my my own uh my own underwhelming social media following is, is not to make excuses for it but there's a couple things one i've i never liked social media from the onset and so i mm -hmm. i didn't actually even really use it until covid happened and i was kind of forced to open my mind uh, a little bit before that i would like pay to run ads when i was doing a show or something and i mostly stayed off of it i especially didn't take any in and I find that if I if you don't take any in, it doesn't bump you up like you need to have you need to have some skin in the game. You mm -hmm. need to be using it as well. You can't just be putting stuff out there. And then also um, there's, you know, I, I think that the that the algorithms in some ways you know, they're factoring in personality uh, and like, well, we know that people like positive messages. And so we're, this, this is like a disagreeable person that likes pushing buttons. <laughs> and some of that is like great and in intention getting I, it's, it's, I wonder how they, how they exactly tease it all apart because some controversial posts are, a boon, you know, for people and go really viral and, and causes interactions and people are fighting and comment sections and, and there's all this engagement. And then other times it's like, oh, people just want to like feel good. So we'll up the, um, the pleasant little quotes and, um, these, uh, these little, these nice sounding quips and stuff like that. And it's, it's, 
like you said in the beginning, they're kind of figuring out what we want, what we want to be served up from ourselves and then rewarding us for for putting out what other people want and and uh, kind of deciding those those interactions uh, for it's almost like it, it it's funny because as a stand up, you go in front of a crowd and you know, someone has a visceral reaction to a joke. They, they laugh even when they don't want to sometimes, or they don't laugh and you know, the joke didn't work, but now to have an algorithm (laughs) judge, you know, in the future of how that will be fine tuned, judge how well that joke is going to land on what audience and put it out there to the right audience or shut it down you know before you get to hear that is it's it's so incredible it is it 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 is and yet it's kind of infuriating too you know (laughs) because uh it it becomes self-fulfilling you know it's Mm -hmm. it has some sense that this thing's going to land and so it puts it out there because more people are going to stay on platform as a consequence of that um and how easy is it to innovate? You know, can can you possibly tell a new joke, or do you have to tell one of the three established, officially sanctioned jokes? You know, yeah. beyond that. Um, and the the nice thing about live performance and about you know writing things that you've written rather than what Grammarly says you should be writing or whatever is that you can break the rules, you know, and, and usually right. when we break the rules, we think we're being iconoclastic and that we're actually just not doing very well. But now and again, we break the rules in a way that's innovative and interesting. And will we see right. art that innovates in the same way, that's creative in, in the same way um, when it's guided by algorithms and when we're testing them out on algorithmic audiences rather than on you know, idiosyncratic collections of flawed human beings. You know, yeah. I don't know. Um, obviously, there's always a space for it. And one of the, the cool things in evolution that you see coming up at all sorts of levels is what's called negative frequency dependence. Basically, it's the benefit of being rare. So if you're, um, if you're a virus and you've got a rare and unseen coating on the outside that allows you to get past the immune system, you benefit for a period of time mm-hmm. until lots of immune systems recognize that because of vaccination or because of, you know, lots of people have been infected. So there's this mm-hmm. advantage of being rare and then that advantage dissipates. Um, and the same thing happens with um, uh, various types of looks in fashion, for example. Actually, we did a paper a few years ago, I might have spoken about it the last time we chatted, about how um, beards are more attractive when they're rare and then as people go, hey, beards are in again and start growing and growing, then when everyone's got a beard, the beard doesn't have that margin and clean-shaven faces start to regain a bit of their margin. And so there's, you know, there's the, the yeah. value of how the person looks with, the, with or without the beard and then that's added to or subtracted from slightly by how popular that look is. Yeah, yeah. To start with, it's, it's you know, copy, 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 and then suddenly it's like, well, I was into it before it was cool you know, and it's yeah, not cool right, right. kind of thing. Um, yeah. And that certainly works with, with all sorts of things in fashion. And yeah, um, yeah. will machine learning driven creativity start to innovate in those ways that creates new original ideas that can get yeah. some of that cachet from being rare or not? Um, yeah, certainly yeah. people we know respond to gee, I've never seen that before. Wow, that's original. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, as long as there are human users, I think there'll be a, a market for that. Uh, but can people, yeah, can we program yeah. uh, innovation in that kind of way? I think it's, a, you know, that will be interesting to see how it goes. That is interesting. And, it, and it's, it's a nice correlation with fashion too, as, as much of the history of fashion as, okay, rich people are, able to afford to pay for this thing that someone has spent a ridiculous amount of time 
basically just displaying that clearly this was hard to make and then they start wearing that or or whatever and then and then everyone else figures out how to do that cheaper Mm -hmm. and starts copying it and then you start the whole cycle over again and that's interesting to think about doing that in terms of things like thought work i mean it certainly happens in music where someone innovates a brand new sound that takes the world by storm and then every band sounds like them for or not every but many bands sound like them for the following several years after that and so much so that those people that innovated that sound now like like don't get as much praise because if everyone has heard everyone else mm-hmm. do that kind of thing. And so EDM or whatever, isn't all the hype that it once was. And, um, I, I actually, if I, if I could just take a slight tangent, um, uh, it's, it's more than a slight tangent, but I want to go back to, uh, I want to go back to something when we were talking about sex robots, I was thinking about how, I don't know if you mentioned this in the book, but the kind of uh, thing that you hear commonly referenced that, that the internet started because of porn. If it wasn't for porn, the internet wouldn't be what it was today. And that hastened our evolutionary drive to gratify ourselves, hastened this, the, the demand for that, hastened the technology and uh, shooting in a better quality and having better bandwidth. And I don't want to wait this long for this picture to populate on my screen. And the downstream effects of that is we have all of these amazing things that happen within entertainment within our ability to communicate uh, uh within our processing power that have nothing to do with mating whatsoever and uh i was thinking in terms of things like sex robots if you if you or or you know any anything within your book uh, dating apps, whatever, where you see some of these downstream, much in the way that uh, you, you send a shuttle to to the to land on the moon, it, you don't just need to build a rocket. You need to figure out how to ration food in a certain way that innovates. You need to figure out these weird plumbing issues that ends up innovating things. Is there, you know, within uh, the demand to build a sex robot that folds up and you can hide from your your parents or whatever you can hide from your mom will that one day innovate some product where like oh well we can use that same technology to collapse a home for or <laughs> make camping better or or maybe my bicycle can collapse in that in that same way are, are there any things like like that that you uh are maybe be optimistic about um in a, in a really general sense absolutely uh you know i don't in know a what sense i'm sorry in I a really that. general sense yeah in a general um, sense. okay so i guess the thing with innovation is yeah i don't really trust anybody who knows what the next innovation is going to be um mm-hmm. unless they're currently <laughs> working on developing it in top secret right now because, yeah you that's, know, that's kind of the nature of these things um, that's a, but, that's those are good words to live by. Yes, yeah, cer- certainly. Um, you know, I think that the the history of of uh, pornography is a is a is a good example of the fact that you know th- this creates demand demand for bandwidth that we didn't think we ne- needed. You know, historically, mm-hmm. sort of statements are so many kilobytes is all anybody's ever going to need, or so many kilobytes per second bandwidth is all anyone's going to need, and of course we blow that completely out of the water. What's kind of interesting to me about that right now is you know, the big thing in, in computing is quantum computing, which is going to be this you know order of magnitude, many orders of magnitude greater processing, power processing, speed. Um, and what are we going to use that for? Is it going to be for uncrackable encryption or for you know incredible computational molecular design in order to design these really smart drugs um, or, you know, what, what's it going to be used for? And, of course, it's going to be used for all of those things. And then it's also going to be used for, you know, super immersive virtual reality evolving porn scenes because somebody will go, 
this technology can be used for that. And in fact, in doing so, it might enhance the, the ways in which that technology unfolds in ways that we can't necessarily predict. Um, I think what you know, one of the things that that vast increases in in um, computing power will do is it'll create vast increases in the quality of artificial intelligence, um, and then AI is going to be able to figure out even more secrets of human behavior and how to keep us clicking on ads even more compulsively or playing games later mm-hmm. into the night. Um, and, and along with that will be will be all sorts of technological software um, and and I guess you know application type of um, innovations that you know are certainly a, a prosaic mind who's sort of stuck on the nature of reality like mine can't really see over the horizon apart from knowing that you know over the horizon is where 99 percent of future technologies innovation and great ideas are, are being stored currently um so yeah I'm, I'm sure we will look back and go wow these things came about and it's funny that part of the reason that that came about is because um you know sex robots weren't their skin wasn't very warm or virtual reality avatars you couldn't see them if they turned sideways or something like <laughs> yeah, that yeah, yeah yeah that's funny huh um, in, in terms of, you, you hear a lot of people concerned about social media hijacking our minds. I, I think that's a, I think that's a real concern. And, um, certainly, yeah, I've had my own mental health issues and I've, and I've found that getting away from computers and social media has, <laughs> has been one of the surest quickest fixes to your average mental health, uh, problem. But, um, I, in terms of how much we should actually worry about social media, say, say the, the idea is combine social media with quantum computing and man, it's going to be irresistible. But going back to the evolutionary constraints and what we have the capacity for and then the environment interacting with that and epigenetic effects and everything else what isn't there limiters on dopamine and endorphin as someone who i'm quite interested and fond of just drugs generally i i i think that it artificially stimulating the mind is is something that is so curious it, we, we've been doing it for a long time through many means chemically or just through experience or whatever else and i i think social media can be a drug in a way uh, in our, our phones and screen time and everything else but isn't there in my experience of even doing uh like hard street drugs or whatever before there there is a limit there there's not a, there's not a limit to like a necessary addiction or suffering or, or but there's only there's only so much unless you're unless you're taking pills or something that are somehow increasing serotonin and dopamine and endorphins or whatever there's only so much that you have <laughs> so so what i mean so I, I I guess what I'm saying is I I push back on the idea that we're just going to be these helpless zombies control we're going to we're going to put on the perfect virtual reality helmet and then we're going to be sucked into the matrix and there's no way out of it it just doesn't seem like our neurochemistry can possibly get us that much more addicted on something than what we've already been. We, we found plenty of things to get addicted to before. And it also seems that it, it seems like it seems that it's not like humans have gotten more addicted to things through, through our modern. It's, it seems like there's always an explosion of some 
new drug or some new thing and we kind of don't know how to handle it and then we do adapt a little bit over time and we do become more mindful our modern culture is so focused on wellness and meditation and all these things that in the 80s to for a kid in Wisconsin, the idea of doing yoga or something like that w- would have seemed absolutely asinine and and organic food or any of that stuff would have seemed so silly. And now in an era where it, if the idea, if the premise is that things are just going to keep on getting more addictive and worse in that way, it, I mean, it doesn't seem to be following suit in a lot of ways it it seems like people are also at the same time becoming a lot more mindful i've never really thought about the the opposition between sort of the addictive nature of social media and and mindfulness being the antidote to that although it's a good point and it's worth i'll have to think about that a bit um Mm. but i guess you got to think a little bit about who's competing with whom. So, you know, we're not, we're not in the situation here where social media may or may not be, but probably is causing, you know, substantial social problems. I think mm-hmm. that the, the case that, um, that, that young people are spending so much more time on social media and so much less time on offline relationships and that that's having consequences for the way that they socialize and for for mood disorders i think is a reasonably solid case i'm, I'm i wouldn't say it's open and shut yeah. but i'd say that the evidence is is very much in in that favor um and and but that's probably that the consequences of that are probably because it's cutting into you know, interactions with family, interactions with people who will say no to you and who will give you some of the, the tough love that you need as well as sleep, just kind of into sleep. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, we're not in that situation because somebody designed something to try and, and cut into our sleep or cut into our relationships or something. It's just somebody right. wanted to rate, you know, the girls on campus by their faces and found that, yeah. you know, lots of other people wanted to do something similar and then they could found other uses for it and then they found a way to monetize it, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm always worried when, when there's these discussions about technology about we must design the technology now so that it doesn't cause harms. We must design the sex robots so that they have fail-safes and that nobody uses it to simulate, you know, coercing somebody into sex, et cetera. You know, that's, that's a reasonable point to make. But... You know, most of the, the harms that result from technologies, whether it's cigarettes or lead in your petrol and, and right. your pipes or, or whatever, those harms don't come about because of design features. Right. That kind right, of right. bugs. This is such and, an important point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I think that what, what we are in at the moment, what people, particularly social media users, but generally users of technology are in at the moment, is we're kind of the 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 fodder in a competition between various different platforms for our very limited attention and with our uh, limited attention is our limited um you know serotonin and dopamine responses to whatever stimulus is available to us and the the f- sort of big fear with um machine learning getting better and better at figuring out ways to keep us on platform and to keep us engaged is that the competition between different platforms and different providers um, and different advertisers, etc., is um, making the products better and better and better at holding our attention and at overcoming whatever our strategies are. We, yes, we do have strategies. I write a book about it. You talk about it on your podcast. Um, right. We become a little bit more aware that we shouldn't wake up first thing in the morning and spend half an hour scrolling through our social media. We should rather get up and go for a walk, you know, and that's that's our response in the arms race. Mm-hmm. But it's not it's not you and me against the technology company. 
We're that's, against all of the technology such a companies. Good, it, I'm so happy to hear you say that because I, I think what really gets neglected, like I said in the beginning of the show, is that, you know, th- this isn't to pass judgment on which is more correct objectively between sociology mm. and evolutionary thinking. But I do believe that that uh, emergent properties of complex systems are something that are really difficult to detect and are underrepresented and understood within the average person. And I include myself within the mm. average person. Um, but, uh, but because I, I think many of those you, you talk about, you've all know Harari earlier and kind of uh, the, the idea that, that, uh, potentially what set us apart was this ability that we evolved to cooperate around these larger ideas and these these fictions that's and when when we say the word fiction it's not as as a judgment either subjective realities are very important but but the the top down thinking that i think comes naturally to humans leads to a lot of other problems in our modern culture, a lot of conspiracy thinking, for mm-hmm. example, and a lot of it, it, it's there wouldn't be anything wrong with conspiracy thinking if, if there's a little more utility in it. But you, but there there's there's just not a lot of accuracy in the aim. It's uh, much in the way that I grew up hearing about the del the devil having this judgment and do this or that or the devil will get you. It seems like a lot of the same thinking is applied to like this Bill Gates or this like for example. I don't like Elon Musk. I'm not a huge fan of him. But also to be like Elon Musk is ruining this or that. The these kind of it's it's like building another sort of deity. Um, mm. that has just a slightly more tangible quality because they are humans and you can you can imagine doing something to stop them or whatever. But um but it, it seems to have the same sort of top-down misunderstanding and under appreciation of these emergent properties. Like like you said, no one designed your water pipe to be rusty. It came along with it. Maybe they were lazy about fixing it. Maybe they covered up how defective it was for sure. But no one designed that pipe mm-hmm. to be that way. Like that's not really a thing that happens so much. And so I really appreciated that point. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> but- no, that's you're a hundred percent right. You know, we we evolved to to deal with human actors. Um, mm-hmm. And to deal with the natural environment and the like, but you know, what, what's the first thing we did? We personified aspects of the natural environment yeah. and put gods in charge of them because we're used to dealing with people and going to, to to somebody and saying, "Hey, you need to sort this thing out. This is in your wheelhouse." Um, mm-hmm. And and then when we realize that there's this massive global entity that pulls in as much money as you know a, a medium sized country. And that there's a person who's identifiable as the CEO or the inventor of that technology, whatever it is, we think that immediately that entire company is designed to assert that individual's will upon the population. And, you know, we did this in, we're still doing it with Rupert Murdoch. You know, maybe Rupert right. Murdoch is that guy, but, you know, certainly 20 years ago, it was all about we've got George W. Bush in the White House because Rupert Murdoch wanted him there. And to some extent, that's true. Um, but, you know, Rupert Murdoch only cast one vote. Um, and yeah, he, he's, his newspaper said certain things, et cetera. But News Corp and Fox are, you know, probably as close to a top down control situation as possible. And yet right. at the same time, they're not just reflecting what the guy at the top thinks because we can all reject that they're also reflecting back to us what we think and what our they're, fears are they're very ratings based they're yes, exactly. very, it's it's are they controlling or are they pandering exactly and my my guess is they're doing a whole lot of pandering mm-hmm. a lot of it because that's profitable there's a lot yeah. of money in doing that people want to hear what they want to hear you know they want to hear th- their own views reflected mm-hmm. back to them in a slightly more erudite way that makes them feel slightly more erudite and incredibly validated. What do people want? They don't want nice. They want me to be validated. 
Yeah, yeah. So as as someone who has been, um, you know, kind of a, I've been cynical about social media since since the onset. I never cared for. I've been more open minded recently, but I also have looked at myself a little bit uh, in my relationship to it, my judgment of it, and thought. You know, because we're we're in the middle of a of a pandemic where there are amazing things being able to happen remotely. Whereas if you look at, I mean, during during smallpox, there was there there were people getting food delivered where they would put their basket outside of their house and people would deliver groceries into the basket and they'd pull it up so that they didn't need to come into contact with that person. And, Mm -hmm. and that, that was the best that they could do to innovate at that time. And they were trying and then they were, they, but they didn't have, they couldn't talk to their neighbors safely remotely. They couldn't talk to someone across the world safely, remotely, easily, like we're doing right now. There's so many advantages of it. And I do, sometimes I wonder, are we just getting so fucking old? Because because there's, <laughs> there, there's no, you never hear anyone say, Man, my kid is just crushing social media. They're like, they're just, they're, they're really good at it, you know. And there are advantages that social media. I have a in person interaction. One, chances are I'm going to be a little awkward. And two, like it will, it will take me so long to find out that someone isn't my cup of tea. Like it, it can take me years to find out someone is an asshole. Whereas social media, I can find out in like 10 seconds that someone is an asshole. And there's, there are, there are so many benefits to some of these, some of these things. And there, and there's something that, that, in, in terms of the freedom of expression growing up in an area where I didn't feel like I was ever able to share the, the, my first, my, uh, all of my, until I was adult, uh, all, all of my childhood, I was the shyest kid or I didn't feel like I could ever express my myself. And I thought a lot of my uh, views or whatever were controversial. And I was raised in a very kind of strictish way. And, uh, and, and now to be able to be able to be the most abnormal person in the entire world, whatever that means, and to be able to easily find a group online of people all around the world that are just like you is something pretty remarkable um, as well. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just, cause, cause your, your book as far as I can tell, seems seems like you have like a, a fairly balanced um, view. That you're you're not you, you kind of tried to stay away from making a hard judgment on one side or the other, kind of against these things, right? Yeah, you know, it's um, I, I've certainly tried hard, and my publisher Elspeth was very good in in looking at the reviews and said, "Hey, you know, there's a lot of people getting a lot of good out of this tech." You're probably, you know, because the um, the downsides are more titillating. Even though I've tried to sell some of the upsides and and give a more holistic view, you know, she she was good at reminding me where places where perhaps you know I, I'd been a bit one eyed about the whole thing because you know I have teenagers and I am concerned about you know. In fact, the book's dedicated to my my kids, my stepkids, and my um, nieces and nephews who have to navigate this world. Which is very different, you know. When I was at college, um, we would go to parties or to class. That's where we would meet people, and you know, usually someone would you know tap you on the shoulder and say, "Hey, do you know that they've got a boyfriend somewhere else or something?" Or um, you know, you you would meet one person every three months that you might be interested in, and so you were very constrained in your social world, whereas, you know, people now can swipe left and right and go through thousands of possible people. And yes, it's very superficial in that it's just, you know, the, the looks um, or the quality of your profile, really, that's influencing whether you're getting left swipes or right swipes. Um, so so, so that, that world's very different and it has its downsides and that there's concentration towards people with great profiles and a lot of people are not getting any attention at all. But then again, you know, you're not relying on your friends to set you up with incredibly awkward 
um, blind dates. I don't even know if mm-hmm. blind dates are still a thing, um, but, <laughs> but you're, not, you're not ending up going on these awkward dates or, or meeting people at parties when you've had slightly too much to drink and then having to run into them every time you go out for the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, That'll be funny when you hear things like that, like in some countries, like we're the only developed nation that still has blind dates. (laughs) We need to do something. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, and, and people who, who are, you know, who grow up in, in in an environment where they don't fit in, you know, especially I think of, you know, um, people who are, um, you know, LGBTQI plus, you know, um, who are the only gay person that they know about or the only sort of gender uh-huh. queer person that they've ever met is themselves are able to yeah. and have been since the internet began to find communities of people who have at least some shared experience with them. And, you know, mm. the stories from all the way back in the 90s through to now of people suddenly realizing that there are other people like them or other people who felt like them about whatever issue we're speaking about or that there were other political views. You know, this this mm-hmm. global connectedness has, has allowed people to find that out. And yeah. you know, I think with the algorithms, they'll probably connect us with people that are like us more often. We may even discover something about our sexuality from the way the algorithm sees us <laughs> rather than the way that we, you know, where we're intentionally going. And those are all oh, great. Oh, is that what I'm into? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I... There, so, so here again, just to, just to prove the the point of the double-edged sword so you have this idea that so i since since the last time we talked i happened to when we first met i was working on a show about a stand-up show about mating behavior I, i tried several different shows uh trying to get people interested in different aspects of of science using fun like themes of a of a show one of them was about psychedelics it happened to take off turns out people like hearing about drugs and i had i went uh i did like a 111 city tour i did a lot of shows outside of that as well but uh reliably what would happen every time every show yeah be like let's say uh, let's say a 200 seater maybe be the average maybe more than that uh it would be 200 people of almost really, really awesome people that they would find because of a social media ad. They didn't know, like in my not North Dakota or whatever, like, oh my gosh, like the flaming lips or Roger Waters or whatever is never coming through their area. And so this opportunity to come out and mingle with like-minded people around this subject that people people were passionate about because other people had, you know, various help with their own mental health issues or whatever, or, or just crazy experiences that they'd been processing for years afterward, whatever it was, it was quite reliably really, uh, like, in shape people that had their shit together that usually were were pretty creative and interesting and had good jobs and there'd always be a couple tables of just your cliche cheech and chong burnout like dabber kind of impair you you know whatever terrific a couple tables of those are adorable and uh it is what it is but for the for the most part as a whole just super reasonable people and social media was able to bring them together in an area now the other side of that is is that covid happens and i post things about like hey get vaccinated or something and those couple tables of dabbers or whatever, those those couple tables of burnouts, the minority of that group of people are the loudest, the most vocal people on social media. They're the ones with all the conspiracy theories they've seen through the matrix. They understand it's all Bill Gates, world domination, takeover, microchip, poison stuff. And 
And if I'm looking at it, had I never toured and met all of those other people, if my only perception of that group of people was with a bunch of conspiracy, like probably not very mentally well people yelling at me this and that about vaccines, I would think this group of psychedelic users is the biggest group of losers I've ever heard of in my entire life. I want nothing to do with these people. And so, so it's hard too with social media because there's this representation of this like very loud minority that then makes everyone form, form these, uh, these uh, creates further division because we we form stronger stereotypes of these archetypes of this is what a conservative is this is what a liberal is because we're interacting with the most extreme archetypes of those things online yeah yeah it's so <laughs> true and you know that the easiest thing to do when you're analyzing a data set whether you're doing it yourself as a scientist or, um, you know, some machine learning algorithm is doing it is to, to find the, the, the vision point, you know? So mm -hmm. you, you'll often see, especially in, in sort of evolutionary psychology, the only significant result in a study is that there's a sex difference. Cause you know what? There's nearly always right. a sex difference. And that might be right. because male, female, or it might be because of gender roles and man, woman and socialization. And it's almost certainly because of a complex thing to do with that. And the same mm. thing is true, you know, with, with, with other ways of segmenting things. So politically, what's the most sort of stable political system, a two party state with a few little, you know, bit players around there, you know, because one of the parties always, if there's a third party, it always gets ingested somehow by, by one of the other parties. But you right. know, politics isn't really like that. It isn't. It isn't all left versus right. It's just that we we very po quickly polarize and we go, "Well, I'm more of the right than of the left," and so therefore, I tend to take on the other things and are more sympathetic to the other things that happen in the right. You know, so mm -hmm. I always say the world is divided into two types of people: um, people who divide the world into two types of people, and the rest of us. But um, that, yeah, that didn't yeah. work. But see if you could work that one out into <laughs> one of your shows. Um, that's, that's fine. But it's yeah, it's it's really easy and really tempting to just you know go for the split and then figure out which side of the split you you you, you land on. And yeah. I think that what's probably happening with a lot of the algorithmic stuff that's going on that's sorting us that's creating our thought bubbles is that you know maybe the splits are more than two-way splits but they're still splits and so the capacity to jump across those groups and to to be some kind of hodgepodge of any you know binary split that, that that's been made is um is probably limited and and that's a pity. I think it's and mm. and and then you you know it's really hard to be exposed to get that kind of exposure that you've got of mm. you know I'm in with these guys and they're wonderful in in their own ways and in the ways that make them wonderful, but in this one particular respect, they're complete assholes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I feel for you, but at least you can see that most of us yeah, just yeah. can't see that because that's not how the world's presented to us. Right. Right. Yeah, well, uh, I've, I've, I've taken us right up to the very last minute that I have you for. And, uh, and so unless you have any uh, last little closing things that, that you wanted to say, I, I want to at least make sure and tell the listeners to check out the new book pre-order or maybe order, depending on where you are on the planet and what uh, date you're listening to this. The book is Artificial Intimacy. Virtual friends, digital lovers, and algorithmic matchmakers. Thank you, Rob Book. Or, <laughs> thank you, Rob Brooks, for joining me. Um, you've been a fantastic guest. It's lovely to see you again. And uh, yeah, this has been a terrific conversation. Always love chatting to you, Shane. It's been awesome, and you know, keep up the good work. It's it's been a lot of fun. Thanks so much. <laughs>